I'd like to um, preface this by, number one, I am not a historian. This is a primer, so there's a, a lot of detail in here um, and, and high level. So again, I started down the rabbit hole of researching this um, and Maureen Brennan was very helpful because a lot of the um, history of schools of nursing in the state I couldn't find any catalog or any information, so she started digging and calling schools to get the timeline of what happened in New Hampshire with nursing. Wow. Um, so that was really interesting. And the um, ANA, New Hampshire Nurses Association, said, you should write an article. And I was like, you can have it, and you can write the article. <laughs> this is what I hope to cover. I hope to highlight the impact Florence Nightingale had on our profession uh, in nursing in America. And again, I was very humble. Pat had loaned me a book that was really a, a fabulous history of Florence Nightingale, and I really did not realize how much she really had influenced nursing. You hear about it, but when you really start to sit and read and understand, it's pretty incredible. The other thing I watched was a BBC presentation on the history, and what was very interesting is from their perspective, and. Um, being British, they were very direct about how Florence was and her personality and everything. They did not sugarcoat. Um, she was one tough lady, mm -hmm. and um, it was just interesting from their perspective. And Pat had the opportunity to go to England, but didn't get to go to the museum. So um, we encourage people if you end up in England, go visit Florence. Mm -hmm. the Where is museum. it? It's right in the middle of downtown London, oh. but the bus doesn't stop there, oh. so it was so like my reason for not going. But I lived in the past. <laughs> it's very, it's really pretty convenient, and people who've gone say that it's like a huge wow road trip. Yeah, so it, it, great documentary if you get a chance um, to ever watch it. And then to understand the development of nursing education over the centuries and to explore the history of nursing and its impact on the future practice of nursing. I have a quote I'd like you to read. It comes from Victor Robinson. He was a physician and journalist. And when you're trying to describe what was nursing like before the dawn of nursing education, I thought this was really interesting and thought I would share it with you. Nursing has been called the oldest of our, yet the youngest of professions. And it really, as I started uh, to do this research, and one of the things that was really interesting, and I'll talk about it later, is when you start thinking about the different specialty practices of nursing, critical care nursing really didn't come on the scene until 1950s. So when you start thinking of really how young the profession is and how different specialties as they emerged really came out of population trends and scientific immersion as well as um, what was changing within the practice and care of patients. So Florence Nightingale, born in May of 1820, upper class, well-connected British family who really had different expectations for who Florence was going to be and what she was going to do. I think most impressive, very well educated, and really, when you look at her history, she really was a mathematician. I mean, it, it's just incredible when you realize not only her presence and her commitment to taking care of people, but she really, the scientific background of what she did and the many papers she wrote was pretty uh, impressive. In 1835, she believed she was called by God to become a nurse. And of course, as she started to immerse herself in the influenza epidemic, more and more she said, this is what I want to do. When she finally announced that to her mother and sister, they pretty much thought she was crazy. They didn't think she should even consider doing that. Again, the wrong type of women are nurses. They had a lot of opinions on her and her pursuing that. However, she pursued, went ahead. She went to Salisbury Hospital, which really was a criminally insane type hospital. Had a lot of issues getting in there. It was pretty short-lived, and she 
started exploring other options. She met up with Elizabeth Blackwell in 1850, and she, Dr. Blackwell encouraged her to pursue some kind of nursing training and recommended her to go to Dusseldorf um, at the institution of Deaconess at Kaiserwerk, and she spent three months training there for nursing. So it was a three-month education to become a nurse. When she left there, though, um, knowing that many of the religious sisters um, had been nursing for a while, she connected with a couple of different uh, religious affiliations and continued to really study the practice of nursing from different venues. Um, she got back um, to England, and lo and behold, little bit of education, she decided to tackle being the superintendent of a hospital. A little bit of education, jumped right in, um, and um, while she was there, um, again, started documenting her experience, um, started seeing trends and different things, and then um, the Crimean War broke out and she decided she wanted to serve. And when she got there, which was uh, pretty incredible. You know, when you think of hospitals, when we think of controlled situations, when you walk onto a battlefield and people are just laying in the mud and muck and, you know, no clean linens, none of these things, she really started to identify over time as she did different interventions, she started improving outcomes to patients. So when she co-located certain patients together, when they started changing linens, when they started changing bandages, when they started cleaning up the physical location, she started seeing something very different and continued to document um, that fresh air, clean water, quality of the environment really had an impact on people's health and went uh, on to document that um, in her notes on nursing. And that really became the primer for nursing education and really was what um, became how she started to set things up when she came back to England. Um, again, was uh, opened a nursing school at the St. Thomas Hospital in London and started deploying the same things that she had learned in the field into a hospital setting. She then, within a year, connected with a statistician and was the first individual to start with doing biostats within hospitals. So in, in that particular book, you see a registry of where they started to say who were the patients, what were the ages, what community were they coming from, and it was really impressive that she really started the data collection that we now utilize very clearly in hospitals to make decisions about patients we were serving. She did not stop there. She then started to notice as different ailing individuals were coming from almshouses or workhouses, um, the degree of disease and pestilence that they were experiencing, but that depending on where they were coming from, there was different diseases and different factions. So she then wrote another set of notes specifically on what was happening within the community and then lobbied, as she continued to do throughout her career, to open a 500-bed hospital because the care in these areas was no longer suitable. But she actually lobbied with Parliament and the Metropolitan Poor Act was an act that invested in opening that 500-bed hospital. She then started to notice, based on the different districts, as nurses were still in, in kind of a visiting nurse role, again, almshouses, workhouses, but then out into different districts, she started to see clearly that there was a role for nursing within the community. And she wrote yet another paper that was all about the community and the impact of the community. And again, as she was developing her statistics and knowing her background as a mathematician, she really was starting to validate everything that nursing was doing at that time with data and impact, as well as what surgeons and doctors were doing. But she really had the foresight to keep doing this. 
She published many, many papers. I, I, I did not realize the magnitude of the papers that um, she published, wrote, that later um, really continued to influence practice. But the other piece of it is, she definitely was a politician. Like when you think about everything she did, um, she lobbied with the um, Secretary of War in order to be able to go to Crimea. She lobbies with Parliament in order to open a hospital, and she continued to do that throughout her career. Um, she also had a significant impact um, later on um, with uh, documents that she wrote that she did not present at the National League of Nurses, but later become foundational for women's influence in political movement. So when you think of Clara Barton, Margaret Sanger, they really had political impact. They were definitely activists and were trying to influence not only the health of the community, but decision makers uh, to do different things um, as well. So she really dedicated um, her life uh, to nursing, nursing practice. Um, and they wanted to um, bury her in Westminster Abbey, and she refused. Um, because she wanted to be buried at her church, which was the St. Margaret's Church um, in the Hampshire area. So it was pretty interesting. She, even in her death, she just was taking charge and she was going to do. So again, pretty impressive woman and I was glad I had the opportunity to really dig and look and learn because I really did not value, even though in sight of Nurses Week and always hearing and always uh, celebrating, she definitely had a phenomenal impact in her city. This is going to be a little bit of history of the United States nursing developing, and then on the lower part of the slide, you will see New Hampshire's nursing schools and, and what actually happened. This is St. Anson College, where I went to school. Nightingale School opened in 1860. The first United States nursing school opened in 1873, and that was the Bellevue Hospital School of Nursing in New York. So that was the very first nursing school. And Bellevue Hospital still exists today in New York City, followed by New England Hospital for Women in Connecticut, which is now Yale New Haven, and Mass General Hospital. And all three schools used the Nightingale curriculum, again, it was a big, vast curriculum at the time, to implement their programs. And then New Hampshire Hospital was the first school of nursing to open up, followed by Margaret Pillsbury, Mary Hitchcock, Sacred Heart, which later becomes CMC, Laconia Hospital, later becomes Lakes, and National Memorial Hospital, which now is Southern New Hampshire Hospital. So at this time, there were 400 hospital-based nursing schools in the U.S. and no standardization of education. It was anywhere between six months and two years. What I thought was really interesting is the University of Minnesota, in 1909, was the first BSN program. So the first program associated with a university. And actually, Dr. Beard, who I thought had to be married to a nurse or something, that he was <laughs> such a proponent. But what he observed is when the doctors were training and nurses would sit in the amphitheater and listen, over time he noticed that the nurses that spent more time with the doctors, outcomes to patients were better. So he really became a proponent that nurses need to be educated in a university setting as well. In 1903 through 1927, many other schools of nursing opened up here in the state. In 1923, a report came out through the Rockefeller Foundation and the Yale School of Nursing. They had looked at nursing school settings, schools, schools of nursing, hospital settings, um, over four years, 70. And really what they came to identify is that there should be some kind of standard and it should be connected with a university or college setting. So again, trying to push towards what should we do, how should nurses be prepared. Walter Reed Hospital was the first Army School of Nursing and that opened in 1923. And it really came, as you will see, some of the history in the United States. We have always had a nursing shortage because any time we've gone to war, many nurses have been pulled out of the civilian setting to be in a war setting. 
So really, after World War II, it became very important for us to think about how do we start training nurses that are willing to serve from the onset. Grant the Red Cross did much of the service um, in the early wars, uh, and, and again, pretty impressive history there too. Um, but they needed to start doing something different because some nurses, once they went to war, never went back to practice. So in the 1940s and 50s, there was a significant nursing shortage um, at the time of the baby boomers after World War II that nurses did not want to go back into practice and they were staying home. So then in 1948, the Brown Report came out and really at this point in time continued to assert that nurses need to be educated in universities and college settings. In 1952, Columbia University introduced its first two-year associate's degree program as a research-based plan to test the new education model. So again, not that old, right? When you really think of a nursing. St. A's first BSN program in the state of New Hampshire, and then followed by the University of New Hampshire and Southern New Hampshire College, uh, which is now Southern New Hampshire University. So between 1960 and 1975, diploma programs started to rapidly decline, because again, we really had asserted that nursing education should be at a, a college level. What was really interesting was that in 1970, the University of Colorado had the first pediatric nurse practitioner program. And when I started looking at the history of nurse practitioners, it really was burgeoning on the western part of the United States because so many physicians did not want to practice in those areas. Physicians wanted to practice in the bigger cities, bigger hospitals. So it really came out of a need, again, a nurse filling a need for communities and patients. Then in 1970, you see Concord Community College has their associate's degree program. And then between 1981 and 1988, there was just a burgeoning of programs that just continued to grow. And then in 1982, the National League of Nurses released its first position statement to affirm VSN is the most desirable minimal level of education for entry level. And look at where we're at today. 1990. The Department of Health and Human Services created a commission on the nursing shortage, fearing the worsening shortage was going to dampen efforts to require BSN into entry-level nursing. So again, Revere now has um, opened its master's program. Then you see Lakes Region Community College uh, opens an ADN program. We see Mass College of Pharmacy coming into the area with a BSN program, Keene State with a BSN program, and then Plymouth State with an RN to BSN program. Between 2003 and 2008, several studies demonstrated that patient outcomes were improved with higher percentages of nurses holding a bachelor's degree. And this was on the heels of the IOM report. And then Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, again, really started to assert with IHI that as they looked at entry level, hours, length of practice, again, finding eight hours is a safer time frame to practice, all of these things come into play. What should the future of nursing look like? So they came out with a report in 2010 that really said nurses should practice to the full extent of their education and training. So again, what we were seeing and what we've seen across the United States is not all um, states will allow a nurse practitioner to be an independent practitioner. So we're lucky in the state of New Hampshire, they're allowed to do that. So they truly can put up a shingle and um, care for patients within the communities and clinics um, and as well as in the hospital. Uh, but across the United States, that doesn't necessarily exist. And if you go to um, action, I think it's actionfornurses.org, um, connected with um, AARP, they keep a running dashboard of all the states and as it shifts, as it relates to the outcomes of are we able to achieve this with the uh, the uh, future of nursing. Nurses should achieve the highest level of education and training for an improved education system that promotes seamless academic progress. So again, pushing the AD to BSN, how do, you, how do we continue to do this? 
Nurses should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare professionals in redesigning healthcare in the United States. So um, as Florence Nightingale, many others um, in nursing history, um, to really be an advocate. So there, there's a push for nurses to be on all kinds of different boards um, to really help influence policy and uh, health needs and disparities throughout the United States. And then, again, this, as I did this research, I really did not realize that we really have always had a workforce challenge. Um, but to really have a more robust um, database about workforce, understanding workforce and nursing, um, and the needs, because a lot of stuff is out there, but not necessarily communicated um, throughout uh, all the nursing ranks. So the United States, in 2012, New York and New Jersey considered a controversial legislation, BSN by 10 law, and it would require somebody who has an ADN prepared nurse to obtain their bachelor's degree within 10 years. New York did indeed pass this in 2017, and it became effective um, in 18. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that actually works, but they are the only legislation out there currently. Um, New Jersey did not pass theirs. So now you see between 2010 and today, Granite State College are into BSN program, DNP programs at the University of New Hampshire, and Revere University. I've been unable, we did call the Mass School of Pharmacy, they do have a doctoral program as well, but we never got the date of when they implemented it um, there. And then in 2018, Grant State College introduced its MSN program. And the interesting thing about this program is um, they are fully integrated with business partners, other healthcare leaders, so even though it is an MSN, it's really a blended program of working with all different um, other leaders uh, in uh, healthcare area. So where are we at with 80% um, of nurses having their BSN? 2018, we're at 56%. However, the doctoral degrees have more than doubled, which was the goal. So really exciting times for us. So what is our current challenge in the profession? So what is our entry level into practice? Is it AD or BSN? What is our decision on the importance of the terminal degree uh, for leadership? And let's explore our history to think about where our future is going. So ponder some of those questions. So very interesting, when we think of early American history um, and colonists, they really had nothing when they came. They did not have physicians, they did not have nurses, they didn't have any kind of medical supplies. So pretty much the first colonists that came over uh, across the United States all died off. So then the second wave of colonists come with a little bit more information, but I think the thing that was very interesting, and I have a great history book on the history of nursing in the USA, um, was they started to recognize the environmental factors. So when you think of somebody coming from England that ends up in Louisiana and, and the environment and the changes, so they started documenting as they were coming over some interesting things. But then again, they met Native Americans within the country and they started seeing the medicinal effects like as they're learning from the Native Americans. And again, things started to change. So when Lewis and Clark decided to go on their exposition. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Lewis's mother was a well-known healer. He also spent time with Benjamin Rush in Philadelphia, um, a physician, before he left. And in his log, he has an entire medical kit that he took. So as he had learned, what should he take with him, which was really interesting. So. He knew, as others had explored as history and, and past, that there needed to be some preparation as he started to move west. The Revolutionary War, uh, Clara Barton uh, definitely had uh, a huge impact, uh, was right in the field and started to um, get women to help support, again, um, soldiers in the field. She later became um, the founder of the American Red Cross 
And very interesting, um, when, when you think of the Red Cross today and all the disasters they responded to, um, back then they responded to mines exploding, floods, um, especially in California, that you wouldn't think that as soon as the glacial wash off would wash out an entire town and they would go to where it finally washed out and survivors were and would truly set up camps in caring for patients and in wagon trains. So incredible that there was a woman thinking of doing this back that early in time. So absolutely incredible. Many epidemics of suffering during this time frame that women were responding to in the role of a nurse and a caregiver. In 1752, the Pennsylvania Hospital opened and had three nurses. And for greater than 100 years, they had men and women untrained who were caring for patients in that hospital. Because again, we didn't get nursing education until the latter part of the 1800s. Another great book, if you get the opportunity to read it, it really is the cornerstone of early midwifery and um, all the different stuff that she documented from her experience in Maine. Again, another incredible woman, and it, when you read what they, they wrote during this time and how they were trying to identify the things that were improving outcomes was absolutely incredible. But I think the other thing that was really important is in 1788, the smallpox vaccine was discovered. So again, as things start to change and as science starts to emerge in practice and outcomes, we start to see a significant change. It was during this time that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin actually started um, pharmacies. When you think of um, what was happening in, in Williamsburg, because they started to identify the medicinal effects of different herbals and different agents. So really started to set up what we see now, apothecaries then, as pharmacies today. Um, and it's pretty amazing. The stethoscope was invented in 1819. So think about, slowly we're getting tools, tools of the trade that we are going to be able to use and employ um, as we care for patients. In 1830, the nursing uniform and cap were identified as the garb to be worn uh, by nurses and really was the shift that um, it was a distinguished profession and, and honored uh, as we go forward. So chloroform is introduced in 1847, so it starts to be the immersion of a specialty practice in nursing, surgical services. 1866, the clinical thermometer is invented. So again, even the tools that we have today how rapidly technology has evolved for us in, in the care of our patients. 1867, females discovered, so identifying antiseptics. So they weren't using antiseptic kind of properties other than you know alcohol and whiskey. Um, so now you have phenol that's been uh, identified and was used uh, significantly. 1879, the autoclave. So again, sterilization, starting to think about how do we care for patients in a different way. And in 1880, I thought this was a great fact, the Bellevue School of Nursing introduced the nursing pin and it was made by the Tiffany Company. So again, when you look at these images and a time, it really is amazing where we are today. So really, the rise of the profession um, started between the 1800s and the early 1900s. So we have massive immigration to the United States. Clara Barton officially founded the Red Cross. World War II, World War I started, and look at how many nurses were enrolled to serve over home. Pretty amazing. And again, when you think of the crash course of what they probably received before they end up um, in the field. So in 1899, aspirin is first introduced. You know what the German company name was? Fair. This floor game, 1900, the first journal of uh, American Journal of Nursing was published. In 1901, the Army Corps of Nurses was created. 
1902, a demonstration project in New York started by sending nurses into schools. Another very interesting story is there were two um, floating uh, hospitals, so they say. Um, one was in New York and one was in Boston. So it's how Children's Floating got its name. Um, during this time, uh, think about the amount of people living in a home, could be 10, 12 people, um, again, sanitation, all of those things. But what they did identify was that if you got children out in fresh air, so they take them out on boats, they had nurses out on these boats, and they also taught about nutrition and care and um, wellness of infants, which was pretty amazing. And then Stephanie down in the OR showed me pictures in a lot of the tenement buildings. They would put like little cages outside the windows so the children could sit outside in fresh air. And I, I didn't believe it, but when she pulled up all these pictures, um, so it's pretty impressive as, again, starting to think about cleanliness, feeding, fresh air, all of those things. 1908, Congress established the Navy Nurse Corps. And in 1909, the first electrocardiogram program was used in practice. 1912, Lavinia Docks was mobilizing the nurses in the suffrage movement, but she also had a significant impact um, when we think about the Expo, the Big E, back then the Big E was where technology was introduced and groups met. It was the time when the National League of Nurses was first being developed. Nurses came to the Big E to start coming together as a group. So it was pretty interesting when you think about the Big E now. Um, but it really was met where different factions came together um, to plan for the future. In 1912, Margaret Sanger was advocating the use of birth control, and again, as I was reading the, her history, um, really an advocate, identifying the maternal and fetal deaths because of how many babies women were having, the populace, what was happening in the location. So again, when you think of the suffrage move, movement and women's rights, that wasn't what she was lobbying for. She was lobbying for the health and the safety of women and children. So again, as, as you get into the context of the history and what impact she had and, and continued to lead with Lavinia Docks, uh, a lot of the stuff that was happening at that time. 1913, state licensure existed in 33 states, but it wasn't mandated. And the reason for licensure was to get a count. So that's what came out of the National League of Nursing. It wasn't a standard, it was, we were trying to get a count, a registry of how many nurses are out there from that standpoint. So again, impressive when you look at the photographs. I think that was part of what kept blowing me away, is as you tied in the time and, and thinking about who they are and what their impact on history was. So 1914, the introduction uh, of the EKG machine, or portable per se. 1921, insulin is discovered. So again, starting to think about treating diabetes. Diabetes is a specialty here uh, as well. 1926, the ANA code was published. 1932, the utilization of antibiotics was an on the increase. Interesting transition. 1938, hospital births counted for half of all births in the country because the push and the influence was doctors should be delivering babies in hospitals and to move away from nurse midwives and delivering children in homes. In 1938, a legal precedent was established that the administration of anesthesia was within the scope of nursing practice. But what floored me the most about this particular document, and, and we all laugh when we hear this, because it referred to the doctor is the captain of the ship. <laughs> and it's in, air, it's in quotes in this document and it has a precedence over making any decisions. So I thought that was funny because you know, you've heard that in your career and it actually was documented and that's where it was documented. So the Great Depression occurred and it was really interesting 
looking at this time because you start seeing the emergence of public health nursing. And as they're moving to these camps, and, and, and again, I have a, a photograph, um, the nurse was the most impactful in the, those transitions and, and really, uh, again, served uh, an incredible need at the time for people. Is the EKG machine. <laughs> and again, when you think of the, just how crude care, where they were delivering it. So the need for nurses exploded in the 1940s. So World War II, there was a thousand active duty nurses. There were new venues for delivering care, ships, airplanes, and trains. And what I found interesting is in the Midwest, they used a lot of steamboats as almost like floating hospitals to be able to get to different locations. So you're starting to see something uh, very different. 1942, there were a thousand nurses practicing in hospitals. 1943, the Bolton Act enabled nursing schools to receive federal funding and to not discriminate on race, creed, or color for educating nurses. So first time uh, government is starting to impact financially the hospitals. 1946, the Hospital Survey and Construction Act promoted the expansion and modernization of hospitals. Hospitals started getting built everywhere in the 1950s. Federal funding, discounts to be able to do that. Post-war, 1943, 20% increase in births. So now, nurses are going to hospitals. What do you think the new specialty is? Maternal child health really emerged and you start seeing a lot of literature very clear evidence regarding that. 1946 to 1950, there were three polio epidemics in the United States, left 27,000 children disabled. So now we start seeing rehabilitation nursing, respiratory nursing, uh, mobility care that time frame. 1950, the Korean War, again, another pull to nurses who serve. 1950, Blue Cross Blue Shield comes on the docket and many of the well-to-do were getting insured to have that little extra that they might need with regards to health care. 1953, the salt vaccine is discovered. 1953, the first identification of the double helix for DNA. So think about where we're at with genome therapy, monoclonal antibodies, and, and how rapidly that science has come to forebear. In 1958, we see an increase in um, use of psychotic medications, antipsychotics, and we start seeing the transition of some of the psychiatric individuals back into the community. So when you think of the insane asylums and kind of that practice, we're starting to see a switch because patients are doing well on some medications and are actually able to be released. So again, post-war uh, nursing shortage, um, what do you think was happening? <laughs> so, late 1960s, increased dissatisfaction for nurses with working conditions, hours, and wages. Our press Caney survey said the same thing <laughs> this past year. And again, when you look at the 1940s to 1960s, it still is very crude and rudimentary. When you look at the technology and you step in a room, step in a clinic, practice what you're doing, in, practices now, from that standpoint, pretty incredible. Specialization expanding the scope of nursing practice. So 1955, I was shocked, sold a defibrillator. 1959, CPR, so I didn't realize that that's not that old either when they first published the outcomes and benefits of that. 1960, continuous cardiac monitoring, and where that came from was NASA and the astronauts, putting astronauts in space. So that's that's where continuous cardiac monitoring came. Then we have the Nurse Training Act, which again substantiated and supported an investment within nursing education and growing the nursing workforce. Medicare, Medicaid legislation, and again, this came into play post-war that the government needed to give back as it related to long-term catastrophic care, war-torn veterans, and really was implemented across the United States for catastrophic care. Then we have Vietnam. 1970s, there's a proliferation of nurse pra 
practitioner programs really started in the West and then moved back towards the East. And again, pretty amazing. Think, think of the monitors now, right? You know, and what you have, an even small portable monitor access to. And then this is a picture of a Colorado nurse practitioner going out to a home. Healthcare in crisis, 1960, uh, U.S. healthcare spend, 27 billion. By 1980s, 255 billion. CDC releases the HIV and AIDS epidemic um, in 81, but universal and standard precautions don't get implemented until 1985. Access to care issues become very evident because, again, you figure we have insured population, people wanting more, so it becomes more and more difficult. Interestingly enough, in 1990, the Persian Gulf War, we see the comfort and mercy ships deployed, and I have a picture of them, and again, starting to think about, in conjunction with the American Red Cross, any major catastrophic event, these uh, ships get deployed and are, are really floating hospitals. 1994, the University of Washington Medical Center had the first magnet hospital in the United States. The 1999 ILM report to air is human. Again, start thinking about the specialty practices of quality, safety, and the importance of zero harm and what really has emerged um, in our healthcare setting today. HIPAA be damned, 1996. Again, confidentiality, everything needs to be in a black box. You can't know anything or share anything. And then healthy people, 2000, 2010, and 2020, established a change in the healthcare goals really of wellness. And again, trying to get um, a shift from the paradigm of illness to wellness. So I had the opportunity last summer, I was in Virginia Beach, and believe it or not, for fun, we did a boat tour of all the battleships in Virginia Beach, and this is the comfort that the Mercy was in dock, and I was floored. And if you ever get a chance, watch some YouTube videos, because you will be amazed when you see what's inside those ships. Culture of health. So again, the impact of September 11th was huge, but I think the one thing that we realize, and as you see, Hurricane Katrina, H1N1, nurses go right in. They go right in to help, to, to have an impact on human suffering, on any anybody that is, uh, needs help. So really uh, pretty incredible uh, when you see these stories, but then you hear the nurses' stories. And I'll reference two books that, uh, again, uh, incredible people. You wonder if, if you're brave enough some days to do that, but very impressive. Medicare's population is increasing uh, exponentially, as we well know and we've heard. But the other thing we're seeing a rise of is nurse-run clinics. So as nurses become independent and can practice independently, we're seeing more and more nurse-run clinics actually opening up. And with a focus on wellness, a uh, significant focus on wellness. 1915, you're seeing uh, a rise on managing population health. And in 2019, we need to start having more agile responses to the needs of the community. So again, seeing a phenomenal shift. So Nurses in War is a, another good book, and Nurse Sitting uh, in the Storm, Voices from Hurricane Katrina. But again, I like the evolution uh, picture there of nursing. So I, this was another great quote. We sometimes think our modern roles are extraordinary and new. That we do as clinicians, educators, policy decision makers, has no bearing on or does not draw from the past. We would be misguided to think this way and to forget that although the context has changed, our clinical and policy decisions are fundamentally steeped in the past. So where is our future? Improving access to care, nurses practicing at the top of their license, ongoing fostering of interpersonal collaboration, promoting nursing leadership, again, terminal degrees in nursing and the importance of that, increasing the diversity in nursing, collecting workforce data, and building healthier communities. Can you imagine when we're really gonna have screens like that? It's not gonna be just CSI. So why I love Concord Hospital? We have 1,100 nurses strong, 
58 different clinical specialties, 25 different roles. We have a biannual nursing residency program and we're seeking certification. We have a multi-specialty chain program with multiple tracks. We have a state-of-the-art simulation lab. We have organizational development programs. We have multiple relationships with colleges and universities. We launched yesterday our International DAISY Recognition Award. We have $2,000 annual tuition reimbursement with a five-year banking period that people can go back to. We have the only pension plan left in hospitals in the state. In 2019, we had three nurses recognized for nursing excellence in the state. Our turnover rate currently is less than 10%, and we have no nurse travelers. So why are we invested in you? We're invested in your success, because you will be heard. We are invested in your happiness, because you will be known. We are invested in your growth, because you will be supported. We are invested in your satisfaction, because you will be valued. We are invested in your future, because you will be home. We are invested in you.